today for September 28th. Our topic is plant purposefully. I'm reading from Starting Your Day Right, Devotions for Each Morning of the Year, written by Joyce Myers. Our anchor scripture comes from the book of Galatians, the sixth chapter, the seventh verse, and our scripture reads as follows. Do not be deceived and deluded and misled. God would not allow himself to be snared at, scorned, disdained, or mocked by mere pretensions or professions or by his precepts being set aside. He inevitably deludes himself who attempts to delude God for what Ever a man sow that and that only is what he will reap. Joyce writes, Choose carefully what you sow through your words and actions, and plant only what you want to reap. For he who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap decay and ruin and destruction. But he who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. And that is found in the book of Galatians, the 6th chapter, the 8th verse. Everything you do all day long is an opportunity to sow good seeds or bad ones that can drastically drastically change things in your life. Get an early start in sowing only what you want to come back to you. And so here again, we're seeing the order of sowing and reaping. And so we know that it is a natural law, right? And so in the spirit, right? So both physical and spiritually, we can reap whatever it is we sow. I find that God is always willing to use me to be a blessing to other people. Because there were times that I needed, right? And when I was in need, God always sent somebody my way to help me just at the right time. And so it's a it's a it's it's a it's a blessing, right? To even be able to assist somebody else when they're in trouble or if there's a need and I can help out, you know. And so it's not about being selfish. You know, we have to be willing to help somebody else. Acts the 20th chapter, the 35th verse, and I'll read from the amplified version. It reads as follows. This is Acts the 20th chapter, the 35th verse. And everything I have pointed out to you by example that by working diligently in this manner, we ought to assist the weak, being mindful of the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said, it is more blessed, make one happier and more to be envy, to give than to receive. It makes me feel good when I can help somebody. That is a fact. Although I may not have a whole lot, but it still feels good to be able to help somebody. I always feel good when I can help my mother. That just, for me, that's like on a different level, you know, because again, I may not have a whole lot, but when I can be able, you know, to my mother say, you know, I'm in the fix or whatever, and I always tell her, how can I say no? Why would I say no? You're my mother, right? And so I love giving to my mother. But it's always a good feeling whenever we can help somebody, right? I learned that even when I give and it's just coming from a place I want to help, God has blessed me in return. We can't beat God's giving. That is a fact. No matter how we try, we cannot beat God's giving. In the, ba in the book of Luke, the sixth chapter... The 38th verse, again, I'm reading from the Amplified Version, and it reads as follows. Give, and gifts will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and runneth over, will they pour into the pouch formed by the bosom of your robe and used as a bag. For with the measure you deal out, with the measure you use when you confer benefits to others, it will be measured back to you. That is the truth. Because I have experience, right? And so let's think of it this way. Whenever you are in the habit of sowing good seeds, down the road, 
whenever a need presents itself. I can remember when I moved to Jersey City. When I looked at a particular apartment, and in Jersey City, they want first month rent, last month rent, and a security deposit in a half. And so I had to come up with close to $4,800, which I really didn't have, right? I had a few hundred, but nevertheless, I'm starting all over, so I have no furniture. Um, I got to come up with this deposit. I was literally, I had nothing. I can remember giving the landlord $500 to hold the apartment because I really, really wanted, you know, this, it was in a nice area. And so not knowing where the money was going to come from, I remember getting a phone call from his wife, right? And she said to me, she said, listen, if you're having a hard time paying you know to move in she said i want you to know honey me and my husband like you we want to see you in this place we think we think you're a good person and you know um therefore if it's a struggle for you to come up with the money she said talk to him right see what he'll be willing to work out with you and i was kind of hesitant right i was kind of hesitant i waited some days and then i think the day that I was supposed to actually give him the money. Now understand, in between giving him the $500, I really had nothing. But God allowed it where when it was time for me to move, I had $5,200. I remember it like it was yesterday. It was like money was coming from nowhere. I called the landlord and I said to him, listen, I am starting all over. You know, I've explained that to you. I said, but I do like the apartment, you know. I said, is there any way I can work out a deal with you, you know, and, and pay, you know, on the security deposit? Because I just simply didn't have it. He said, well, you know what, Nikki? I'll do this for you. Pay your rent to move in for July, and I won't charge you the last month rent in the security deposit. What? And so that's what you call favor of God, right? Because we know that the favor of God will make you an exception to the rule. He said, if it was anybody else, you know, I don't normally do this. He said, but I trust that I can do this for you. He said, so that's with that being said, all you have to do is pay me the rent to move in. When I did go give him that rent money and got my keys. I went to Walmart and I had three shopping carts. I went and got, my whole house was furnished when I moved in, just like that. And it looked like I had been there for some time. So the favor of God, you know, but I don't think that that was a result of just one situation. Sometimes we can do things and, and, and sow so many good seeds that we just store it up for ourselves. It never pays to be selfish. It never pays to just think about me, myself, and I. And so we can't beat God's giving. The favor of God is so powerful, right? The favor of God. I can remember experiencing a moment in my life where I was talking to a pastor. She was driving me home. And this was in Rochester. And I said to her, I've experienced so much hurt, Pastor Evans. You know, I just felt like, is there, would, would, there, would there ever be any happiness, right? Because it literally seemed like every situation was just hurtful to me. And, and at one point in my life, I had to look at myself and say, I'm, I'm a hurt woman. And you know what she said? She said something so powerful. She said, I love God, people, because they are so encouraging. She said to me, she said, Sister Nikki, I want you to know the other side of favor hurts. And I thought about that. And that is the truth. Because in situations where people have hurt me, I still call their names out in prayer. 
I still ask God to, you know, whatever the situation was, I have a falling out with my best friend. And, and so we kind of stopped talking. And I even said, you know, I just didn't want the friendship no more. And when I learned that she was having a problem on her job, I could remember praying, Lord, she has that house, her car note, her daughter's in college. Please bless her that she can be able to maintain. And so I'm not selfish. I'm not selfish to a point where people hurt me. I still want to hurt them. Not saying that I don't feel that way. But when you practice sowing good seeds, my bishop always say, would you ask God to make happen for somebody else? God will make happen for you. And that is the truth. And so I don't believe in selfishness. Because I have the favor of God. And when you have the favor of God, you want other people to experience that. That is a fact. Hebrews, the 11th chapter, and the second verse. Let's see here. Okay. Hebrews 13, verse 2 says, Do not forget or neglect or refuse to extend hospitality to strangers. In the brotherhood, being friendly, cordial, and gracious, sharing the comfort of your home and doing your part generously, for through it some have entertained strangers without knowing. Now, that same apartment in Jersey, I could remember one Friday, and I was working hard at this job. I was salaried, but I think I was putting in close to 50 hours a week. And so when I started attending the church, I was going just the Sunday services because I had to find a church home. And so um, this is before I um, came to Long Island City, um, Center of Hope International. Nevertheless, when I did find a place to worship, I was only going Sundays. And so this particular Friday, um, I was at work. I got a text message from Pastor Cherry. And she said, hey, Evangelist, we're having um, a Friday service tonight. I just wanted to know if you wanted to come out. So I said, okay, sure. It was June 1st, 2012. I said, sure, I'll be there. I was working on 34th Street between 9th and 10th Avenue, and I lived in Jersey City. So I had to leave work, go home, get dressed, right, and then take a bus to the other side of Jersey. I was tired. I won't lie. I, it was a long week. I really wanted to just go home and rest, but I told her I was coming, so I came. As the service went through on, it was a good service. The woman of God preached. She prophesied to the house. And then, you know, they say prophets stir up other prophets. Then Apostle Cherry prophesied to her congregation. And so when I looked at the, the time, it was 1220. What? It was past midnight. So the first thing in my head was, again, I'm in Jersey City. The buses stopped running. So I said to myself, don't worry. Just ask Pastor Cherry who is going on that side and can somebody give me a ride. Service ends, right? Comes to a close. As I go over to Pastor Cherry to ask her, the Lord said, don't ask for a ride. Right? So it's 12.30 at night, pouring down rain. I only had $2 in my pocket. So when the Lord said that, I said, good, I said my good night, told her I enjoyed the service. She'll see me Sunday. As I walked out the doors, I put my umbrella up. And so now I'm saying, I said, okay, Lord, there is a reason why you told me not to ask, you know, for a ride. I don't have to tell you it's midnight. Right? I don't have a ride because I don't drive. I took the bus there. So I said to myself, well, it's the ATM up the you know, it's the bank up the street. Get some money, call a cab, and be on your way. That was the plan. As I approached the bank, there was a woman standing on the corner. She had dreads, she had this huge cut in her face. She was, you know, really rough looking. So she turned to me, she said, Excuse me, miss. Um, I want to know, can you help me out? I'm, I'm not no homeless person. I'm not no bum on the street. She said, my girlfriend and I got into a fight. 
she kicked me out. I live in Atlanta City, which is like six hours from Jersey City. And she said, I'm just trying to get um, bus fare money to go home. So I reached in my purse. I gave her the $2 because that's all I had. And so I went over to the ATM, took out some money. And so now I'm trying to call for a cab. But because it was a rough side of town, nobody had cabs available. Nobody. And you could tell it was a lot of activity going on. It's the first of the month. The drug dealers are out and you see the people, you know. And so as I was standing on the corner with the young the woman, I, we were under my umbrella because she you could tell she was soaked. And so when she got under my umbrella, she said, you know, thank you. You know, I appreciate it. She said, I've been standing out here and nobody won't help me. She said, I'm cold. I'm hungry. My sugar is low. And so I reached in my bag. I gave her some candy. And she was like, oh, my goodness, thank you so much. And so it was at that moment she began to get real personal. She said, you know, I stood out here since about 1 o'clock in the afternoon. She said, you see all these people? I, I'm watching the same people cop from these drug dealers. They got it to help me. They just won't help me. And she said, that's real foul because I know they're getting high. She said, and it bothers me. And it's almost discouraging that I stood out here all this time and won't nobody help me. She said, I'm a recovering heroin addict. She said, and you know, at some point, you know, she said, I thought about, right, getting high. She said, but my mother died a few years ago. And I promised my mother on her deathbed that I would never use heroin again. And so she said, when her and her girlfriend started having problems, and, and and her girlfriend, it, like she chose her children over her. She showed me a huge scar on her wrist and her hand, which she said she tried to kill herself. And, you know, so I, again, I'm tired. I'm hungry. I want to go home. It's cold. It's raining. And so I said to her, just be encouraged, you know, you know, God will make a way and, you know, you know, honor your you know, promise to your mother. Don't go back because there's nothing back there. You know, I tried to do the best that I could you know, and ministering to her. So now it's like 1.15. So I'm saying to her, how are we going to get out of here? Because I said to her, you can ride as far as I'm going. I don't know where the bus station is in terms of where my house is. I said, but you, you're willing, you're free to ride. And she said, oh, okay, you know, but I still need a bus ticket. I said, listen, I can't help you. You know, I gave you what I got and that's just it. And then listening to her, I'll never forget this, and listening to her, she started to have these confessions, right, about homosexuality, how she knew it was wrong. Her grandmother, you know, was um, a preacher, and so she knows God, and, you know, and so when I thought about it, I said, wow, you know, you know, she was having a moment. The natural side of me wanted to tell her, I don't care, right, I'm tired, I worked all week, they done had service way too long because now I can't even get home and so I said to her you know what come home with me right take a shower you can dry wash your clothes and dry them get yourself something to eat I'll give you a ticket in the morning to get back to Atlantic City she said you'll really do that for me I said absolutely because it's obvious you have no other help Right? She said she was calling her family and they wouldn't, nobody could send her a ticket. They told her she had to wait. So I said, I'll do that for you. Why not? Again, when you've experienced the favor of God, you can't not help people that are in need, no matter what the situation is. My bishop testified about some funerals that he had, you know, um, presided over. He paid for them. We would, we would never know that. And he wasn't saying for bragging purposes. He was more so telling us that we need to get our affairs in order. And he said, you'd be surprised how much of these, how many of these funerals I've done. And I paid for them. You know, and so when you experience the favor of God and the goodness of God, you want to help people no matter what their situation is. And it was at that moment when I told her she could come home with me, dry her, wash her clothes, take a shower, get, you know, and get herself something to eat, and I'll pay for her ticket tomorrow on the first thing to Atlantic City. No sooner than we said that, I said that a cab pull up, it was a young lady going to the ATM, 
that cab driver said, oh, y'all need a cab? He called somebody who pulled up right behind him. Now, all that time, we were sitting out there. And it seemed like the moment I thought of that, that's when transportation came for us to go. And so when we got to my house, she continued to cry. And, you know, she was saying, I'm admitting things to you that I never shared with anybody. She said, my mother's gone. My family don't really, you know, deal with me. All I really had was my girlfriend. You know, and so at this point, I'm tired. Now I'm home. We done showered, ate. I'm ready to go to sleep. But I did the best that I could to show kindness to her. So I listened. Nevertheless, the next morning came. Thank you, Jesus. I'm in my bedroom. I'm looking up, um, you know, the times of the buses. I tell her, help yourself to whatever's in the kitchen. I'll see what time your bus leave, and, you know, we'll go from there. And so once I found the schedule, I remember her coming into my bedroom and posted up, and then the tears started rolling down her face. And I said, wait, wait, wait. You don't cry, you know, it's okay. You know, God, he blessed you, you know, he, he made a way for you. She said, no, that's not it. I said, well, you know, what is it? She was like, don't look at my tears as a sign of weakness. And I said, well, technically, if I was going to judge you off of appearance, I would have never brought you a total stranger home, you know. I said, so I'm not, I would never look at them as a sign of weakness. I acknowledge that. Tears are just an outward of expression of what's in the heart. And so she said, I have been standing outside since like 1 o'clock in the afternoon. She said, I watched so many people buying drugs. It was the first of the month. She said, I know people had their checks, their welfare checks and their Social Security checks. And they buying drugs. And wouldn't nobody help me. She said, and I sat there and I kept looking up at the sky saying, God, please help me. How, what I'm going to do? I'm lost out here. I don't know nobody. And she said, as the time went on and it got later and later, she got really discouraged. She said, finally, she looked up and she said, well, God, I know you're real, but you're not answering me. And so since I have nothing and nobody, she said, I'm going hustle up enough money to get me a bag of dope and I'm going to kill myself because I won't be keeping the promise, right? I promised my mother I wouldn't use heroin again. She said, and in breaking that promise, I wouldn't be able to live with myself. She said, so I'm going to hustle up me some money for a bag of dope and then I'm going to kill myself. She said, no sooner than I said that, she said, here you come walking down the street. She said, I didn't know church folks was in church that night. I didn't know it was a service going on that time of night. She said, so the fact that I did not anticipate to see this day, because I had, she said she had, she had made up in her mind she wasn't going to see Saturday. She said, and the fact that I made it to see this day, she said, nobody could never tell me that God doesn't love me. She said, because when I had made up in my mind to end it all, here comes you. She said, he sent me you. I'll never forget Dawn Marie. And here the writer says, do not forget or neglect or refuse to extend hospitality to strangers. I live by this word. I'm not doing my own thing. I live by the word. Do not forget or neglect or refuse to extend hospitality to strangers. In the brotherhood, being friendly, cordial, and gracious, gracious, sharing the comforts of your home, and in doing your part generously. For though it some have, for through it some has entertained strangers without even angels, without knowing it. When you receive the favor of God, and you know that God has blessed you and shown you favor, you don't keep that to yourself. You want to share that with others. Because as the, the woman said, nobody will ever be able to tell me God don't love me. I was ready to end it all. She said, because understand this, I knew I was going to get some money for some dope. 
She said, that, that wouldn't have been a problem. She said, and I had made up in my mind, it was over. She said, in the moment that she said that, she said, here you come. A quarter to one that night. I didn't know people was in church. Listen, that was the only time I was ever in church that late. But I see why God told me not to ask for a ride. You see, we have to understand that this thing is not about us. And so if I would have listened to the human side, I was tired, I was hungry, I was cold. I had worked like a slave all week. I didn't want to hear her story. I felt bad for her. I gave her the $2, but that's all I had. But when you are willing to let God use you, he'll do, he will do things that will blow your mind. And so I always remember that young lady. I try to call her number. The phone rings, but it goes straight. It goes to voicemail. How do I not know that was a strain, an angel, right? It says, don't, do not, I have to read it again. Do not forget or neglect to refuse to extend hospitality to strangers and the brotherhood being friendly, cordial, and gracious, sharing the comforts of your home and doing your part generously. For through it, some have entertained angels without knowing it. That is a fact. Because even when I checked on her or tried to check on her to see that she make it, the phone just rang. If I dial that number now, that this happened in 2012. It is 2014. It doesn't tell me that the number is no longer in service. The last time I dialed it, it just rang and went to voicemail. Hi, it's Dawn Marie. Not available. Leave me a message. What? The favor of God, because he lives, I can have his favor. I can experience his favor. Because he lives, I can have what it is that I need, that I'm in need of. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Because he lives, God can bless me in that way where I can be a blessing to someone else in their time of need. Jesus said it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. You're blessed anytime you can give to somebody and help someone when they're in need. That is that blesses me all by myself, all by itself, right? I make available, make myself available to God because you never know who is where, what they're going through, what they're experiencing. And in Dawn Marie's situation, homegirl was going to take her own life. Remember, she was arguing with her girlfriend. She had the scars to prove that she attempted suicide once before just wasn't successful and so when people are suicidal they see no hope she had you know she had no no one to call on in that situation you know I get in the situation I have people I can call you know but she had no one and the only person she could look to was God and because he didn't come she was ready to give up and the moment that she got she said, here you come, my angel. I was just a willing vessel used of God. And so I thank and I praise God. He lives. And because he lives, I can be blessed and I can be a blessing to others. I may not have much, but whatever's in my power to do, I offer it. I try, the Bible says God will not forget your labor of love that you show towards others in his name. Right? God sees the generosity and the kindness that I extend even when Nikki don't feel like it. But I do it because I'm trying to show other people the love of God. I want people, when they look at me, see a reflection of the Father. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Some of my best, I think, um, times of ministering to others were through acts of kindness. Thank you, Jesus. But because he lives, I don't have to be selfish. Because he lives, I can be a blessing to somebody else. The scripture in Malachi, when it talks about the tithes, God said, bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be me in my house. And see, don't I open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing. You shall not have room enough to receive it. You'll have so much you'll have to bless somebody else. That's what this is all about. That's what this is all about. Apostle Paul tells us in Acts 20, that 35th chapter, we are to look, see about the weak, those that are in need. Absolutely. It's not about us. Get rid of the me, myself, and I. As long as I got, I'm good. 
No, 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 no. That's not how it works in the kingdom. In God's kingdom, we take care of one another. We look out for each other. I can remember a pregnant woman. She was getting off the path train and her shoe was untied. I'd see she was, her belly was too big to tie her shoe. And so I said to her, step aside because it was rush. It was the morning rush crowd. So I said to her, step aside, let me tie your shoe. She said, thank you because I can't bend. I said, it's okay. And I bent down in front of all those people and tied her shoe. God see that. I don't do it because, right? But I, I, I want to sow, as, as the scriptures say, I, I'm only going to reap whatever I sow and nothing else. So I sow good. I don't always be a recipient of it. My children, at times, have become a recipient of my seeds, my good seeds that I sow. I like to sow into the ministry, into my bishop's life. I just don't, you understand? I just don't make it about me. And when God gives me more than enough, and when I take care of my household, and I, I know that there's, the bills is paid, there's gas in my car, I got food, you understand? And we have everything we need. I say, okay, Lord, what would you have me to do? You know, I've taken care of what, and this is what I have. Make yourself available. You can't beat God's giving. Because he lived, we can be blessed. I know that I know that I know that I am blessed. And because he lived, we can be blessings to others. There's somebody who has a need. Folks got a need. We just have to be willing. Hallelujah. I thank and I praise God for being willing to be used. To be willing to be a blessing to somebody. He lives. Until next time, be blessed and stay blessed.